Good evening. Good morning. Welcome to this much awaited session of organizational wellness and the culture of coaching. Terrific to see so many of you here already. Uh, we have a wonderful session planned for you today. Um, very excited to be part of it. As you know, as you can see from all of us who are logging on virtually, the pandemic the last 18 months has really brought into sharp focus the urgent need to manage the stresses that employees of organizations are facing, both in personal and professional lives. Uh, holistic 360 degree wellness is critical aspect to managing individual and therefore organizational wellness. And uh, a coaching approach can definitely facilitate an integrated individual and organizational well-being, you know, across all elements, physical, mental, uh, emotional. Um, we have a fantastic panel of experts lined up to you for you today. Um, I'm very happy to introduce them. Um, first, up first, Venkat, Venkat Raghavansi, MD and HR operations lead of Accenture India and Sri Lanka. Um, he has been instrumental in getting mental wellness journey, one of the foremost and front runners in this space in the country to be a revolution over the past two years. In his 20 something years with Accenture, or 18 plus years and 20 years overall, um, he's covered every gamut of HR service delivery, Sri Lanka, uh, in India, and United States. He's a coach in his own right, a Gallup certified strengths coach, several coaching accreditations, and a facilitator as well. And from the health aspect, he's certified level two nutrition coach from Precision Nutrition. And personally, he's an amateur athlete, a brevet cyclist, and fitness enthusiast. So who better to listen from? His co-panelists today, welcome, Venkat. Co-panelist today, equally accomplished, Arvind Krishnan, founder of The Fuller Life. And uh, The Fuller Life, for those of you, many of us who have uh, engaged with him, one of preeminent uh, employee well-being companies started in 2001. He is also the founder of Runners for Life, a running community that organizes some of the best foot races in the country, uh, as well as the Corporate Health Summit, uh, very much in tune with the subject today, um, uh, an event that's been running from 2017. A uh, conference focused on organizational well-being. Uh, a graduate of engineering from Mumbai and I am Calcutta. He has 25 years of experience across varied companies from India.com, Kale Consultants, and Amita Bachchan Corporation, all in the startup space. That's the common thread. He's a student of business, running, and fitness, not in that order as he claims, and lives by the credo, one life, do more. Welcome, Arvind. Great to have you on board. Thank you. And to accompany both our distinguished speakers today. We had to have someone of equal status, John Sarao, master coach, and uh, an executive mentor and coach passionate about partnering with individuals to enable them to grow to their fullest potential. He's managing partner of Sarao and Associates, providing corporate training and facilitations in the area of leadership, business acumen, and coaching. Uh, in his past avatars, uh, John likes to refer to himself as a bean counter, downplays it, but he is an FCMA, FCS from India, and a past finalist of SEMA UK. Uh, and icing on the cake, uh, an uh, athlete, an avid golfer, and saxophonist. Um, so John, with that brief introduction, uh, we'll hand it over to you to take us through a lovely orchestration of what promises to be a great session. Raj, thank you for that uh, warm uh, introductions and welcome. Uh, Arvind, I'm going to start off with you. Uh, given the work that you have done uh, with different corporations, um, what has, and the fact that the pandemic in the last year and a half has brought this to the fore, what makes health important for corporations? Well, I think the way companies and individuals see health has changed dramatically. But, you know, let's look at it from, let's say, a 30-year horizon, a 40-year horizon for startups. Though, of course, like most things, it, these things accelerate, right? 30, 40 years ago, a company was not too worried about your health unless you happen to be in the manufacturing sector. If you're in the services sector or if you're in government, there'll be facilities, but usage is not critical. Now, if a lot of our output is really intellectual in nature, then the company is to make sure that we're in reasonably good shape to be able to deliver that output. So from a company's point of view, if it's market cap, to put it brutally, is linked to what comes out of the people, then the people have to be in good shape because they become, so to speak, factors of production. So that it changes it from their point of view. From an employee perspective, that game has changed too. Because earlier, uh, this was not necessarily on the table. Companies, some companies used to have a lot of things going as far as health wellness is concerned, but not every company. 
but now this is part of the implicit contract not the explicit contract with the company saying uh, the company is going to watch out for my health is something that people are going to look out for so i think the last two years have taken what would probably have been a 10 15 year evolution cycle and just compressed it in this is like somebody invented the wheel and suddenly all of a sudden you can make wheat and you can move faster as well as send something to the moon right everything just gets faster because of this so i think the basic paradigm has shifted quite dramatically and once that shift has happened you can't shift back so now the now the base stakes are a company does something as far as an employee's health is concerned and even if you're a 50 percent company your people are going to say what do you do as far as health is concerned so that, that that construct has changed. And similarly, as reflected like that, in the person's head, their health has taken a much bigger view because they can see immediate effect of it, right? Like I'm in reasonably good nick, I'm expected to get through this reasonably well. I'm not in good nick, look, I might have a problem. And that's become obvious and apparent. And you have so many data points that it's just straight off the bat now. So since all this come together, you have a bit of a perfect storm happening. And therefore, I think the equation has changed quite dramatically. But that's just a, a brief summary. I think I'll try and keep answers short so that you know we can get more questions. Back to you, John. Sure. Th thanks, Arvind. Thanks for that. You mentioned data points. What kind of data points are we looking at? Uh, that's a... Well, uh, let's try. We've been working in health and wellness for about two decades now. It finished two decades in December. And people talk about health a lot, but actually doing things, right? So for example, a question to the 73 people attending would be, how many of you have spent 50 minutes or 45 minutes three times in the last week on doing something for your health? This is the WHO guideline, right? The WHO guideline, I'm sorry to say for those of you who have just done 150 minutes, it's a minimum of 150 minutes, right? For people, uh, it's from 150 to 300 minutes. I actually went and checked it again. And for those of you who are over 65 and saying it's cool, I've got news for you. It gets worse. It's 150 to 300 minutes, but three times of strength training, right? <laughs> so it's very few people who do it. We also have runners club called Runners for Life, right? So we know that the number of people doing it is not that many. You can take a simple example. You live in a complex or a building or you know about 100 houses nearby. 100 houses nearby is typically 200 adults at least. Let's say, you know, I'm, count, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but let's assume that it's 200 adults. How many people do you see during the lockdown? Everybody's workout schedule is kind of obvious unless they were doing yoga at home or something like that, right? Which is possible, but you you might hear about it, you might not. But how many people have actually done things like that, right? Are actually doing the 150 to 300 minutes. Yes, I mean, for those who are asking, yes, we can include walking. Moderate to vigorous is uh, whatever. So if you're doing five days, it can be fewer minutes, right? But it's not that many people. The guidelines are very clear. If you're an adult between, you know, uh, 18 to 65, 64, according to uh, the WHO, according to the WHO, not the band, and what, what you need to do is to do that many minutes plus strength training for two days a week. Now, I will be surprised if this number crosses the low single digits among people whom you know, right? In terms of percentages, it will be, it is absolutely low number of people. And if it is that low a number of people, you know by definition that when a disaster strikes, um, there will be blood. And that's really what happened. So, you know, we talk about health, but when something like this strikes, it separates, it, it makes that data very real to people. And then suddenly everybody realizes that, look, this is the data that we, uh, we have to deal with and, um, you know, make our peace with. And that's what's really happened in the last, well, in the first wave and then again in the second wave. Back to you, John. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to defer to Venkar. Given what we have heard so far from Arvind Venkat in terms of both the kind of work that corporations are beginning to do and the data that he has just shared, including you know the, the empirical data that we can even get from the 70 odd participants that we have here. What, what is the kind of uh, steps that uh, Accenture is uh, doing in this direction? What are you seeing there? Well, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually firstly just lead by uh, something that's already in the private space. 
that uh, it is it is it has been our um, you know stated uh, you know mission for our people that you know in this uh, in this highly digital world that we will strive to be a truly human organization and a journey that we began many many years ago and we've been actually placing a lot of focus on engaging the whole self of an employee you know whether it's uh, heart body mind or soul and uh, you know and you know everything that arvin says is 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 something that resonates right in order uh, to sustain high performance one has to you know make sure that the whole person shows up uh, you know whether it's uh, in their personal or their professional life and very simply you know the philosophy of you know truly human is really uh, making sure that an integral part of our engagement uh, you know emphasizes and enables platforms for people to live their passion focus on mindfulness health and really celebrate an enhanced purpose of belongingness at all times and there are many many interventions in each of these areas uh, you know that we continue to focus on to make sure uh, you know people can bring their best selves to work and, the, and i'll give you some examples you know body is all about exercise <clears throat> sleep digital detox uh, etc heart is around connectedness you know spiritual mental you know the mind is really around how do you focus how do you be productive how do you leverage your strengths play to your passion and soul is around you know how do you create a sense of purpose uh, in your being um, it could also involve spiritual practices so on and so forth so it it's really the entire spectrum you know that we've embraced now you know unlike you know very similar to you know most uh, very similar to many many organizations um, you know the areas of focus <clears throat> have been you know a few years ago uh, you know for us to really think about how do we uh, especially around mental health how do you stop the stigma but i think the pandemic has really changed all of that you know wellness is now you know the conversation on wellness in general is now a given one doesn't have to force it uh, uh, and you know therefore it you know it changes the platform on you being able to do far more progressive things than to invest a lot of time bringing people to the ta table to talk about wellness back to you john all right thank you thank you welcome so uh you know, uh, given the fact that, um, and I know that uh, Arvind, you and I have discussed this in a previous conversation, you know, where there's a whole lot of talk around wellness. We see that, right? People talk about wellness. This pandemic has, th you know, thrown that out in the open. Um, and I think there's a realization that people should be doing this. There are some who do it, and you spoke about the single-digit numbers. So, in terms of strategies, Arvind, uh, what are you seeing companies do to to get people to actually start doing something about wellness? They're trying all kinds of things. So, you know, if I look at it chronologically, but literally over the last 18 months or so, when the pandemic started, March last year, we most companies started by organizing a webinar on this and a webinar on that, and promptly there were the webinar memes that made their way, etc. about it. So you know that that happened, right? And after trying that, I think everybody, once everybody realized that this is, the new normal but you know the new normal is that there is no normal anymore i think that's what we've all realized people started trying more structured things right and that's true of companies like us we started presenting creating doing better things because our job is to get people to get healthy i mean we call the fuller life for that reason right we want people to lead the fuller life right and the thing is that uh, so it became a quite a clear approach saying our approach always over you know, north of a decade and a half has been that we worry about physical health, emotional health, social health in terms of how we engage with people around you, uh, financial well-being. So we worry about that. So companies started doing piecemeal efforts in multiple directions, right? So they would, even a smaller company, which earlier would never think about it, would get an EAP in place, for example, or somebody would get the telemedicine service, or at least the state-run telemedicine service, that number would be pushed out to everybody saying, if you have a challenge, please dial XYZ number and you'll have state support, government support. It could be an NGO, whatever. But people started doing these things. Now we are seeing the next stage of that evolution, especially with Wave 2. Right? Wave 2 was really the eye opener because Wave 2 just hammered in that thing to say, okay, guys, this is here to stay. Whether we like it or whether we don't, this is here to stay. The kind of stuff that we used to do earlier. What were companies doing for well-being earlier? Let's always contrast with that. Health checks, 
typically for uh, maybe senior management or, or everybody at uh, large depends on whether you're a product or a services company, what's the size of wallet, so on and so forth. Or they would do that if they, it's a, if it's a manufacturing outfit, they have a completely different basket of things. They actually have a completely different set of regulations that govern those things, right? But now companies, mostly the white collar companies, for example, started welding all these things together. And we started putting things together also, not just us. I mean, the entire industry, it's not about us. And company, everybody started converging towards having these plans. And I think companies realize that you have to break it down into multiple pieces. You have to break it down into making, you might have something wonderful, but awareness is a big challenge. You get awareness sorted, adoption is still a challenge. You know that the EAP is there, but I, you know, uh, uh, but EAP is you know one of the examples. But I, the, I think the classical example that I always have the the analogy always is to think of it like having an army, right? You want the army, you'll pay for the army, but you're not going to pay for you're going to pay more if more bullets are fired. That's not how you use an army. Ideally, you never want to use them. It's the knife on the table. You keep it there. It's a sign of power, and that's that, right? So, the, so those services became like army or fire services. You have to have them, but you hope like hell they don't have to use them. So all this started tying together. So awareness done, adoption battle, adoption done. And it, it's a tough thing and it's still getting done in different domains. You know, different realms of business will have different challenges. So physical well-being, adoption might be easy. Mental well-being, not so easy. Financial well-being may be far away for some, may be very easy for others. Dependent on the culture, age, so many things around it, right? Then you have to make sure that the offerings are valuable, that you've not picked some random person to do a service that you think is useful, but you know that the service has efficacy. And then once it is efficacy, you'll talk about it and then they'll say, oh, okay, it's okay. I'll, I'll go for it. And I'll tell you both that, Hey, Venkat, John, you guys should go and try this. It's excellent. So you have advocacy coming in there. Once that is done and we're still somewhere in that journey, different, different strokes for different folks in this in different companies. Once that is done, you'll build organically some kind of communities inside the companies, right? And in a virtual world, building communities saying, okay, we'll meet on Sunday and go for a cycle, right? I mean, Venkat rides, you know, long rides. So getting a bunch of people going is always going to be a challenge, especially in terms of reintegrating and creating new groups. And then it will seep into the culture of the place, right? Of course, some companies short circuit and think that if you talk about it and if leadership talks about it straight away, it becomes part of the culture. I'm afraid that's not the case. It becomes culture when it is seen, used, has people around it, and then it becomes part of the culture. So every organization is to find where it is on that life cycle. And we can see the organization trying to make that happen. So I know it's a long answer to a simple question, but you understand that it's in, like, you know, the reality, the reality we face is nuanced and it's important to get that reality across to you. That's really what it looks like. So companies are trying to figure it out. They have a patchwork quilt happening. The quilt is coming together. And, but what I do see is there are a lot of things available to the average white collar or blue collar employee in the country, either from the community that he or she lives in or from the company or indeed from the state or the central government. There are lots of avenues open, right? And there are lots of people offering lots of services. So we have to, um, we have to see how this plays out, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be an interesting ride for all of us. I, I am certain it's going to be interesting, right? So the anecdotal case is always, you know, some people who thanks to the lockdown have become enormously fitter and we know of some people who have, shall we say, gone the other way, right? So I think it's going to say, it, it, we're going to see a bit of both. Back to you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so that was an interesting, um, you know, uh, take uh, on what corporations were doing. You spoke about how Accenture has started this process, um, you know, many years back. So, what have you seen in terms of, you know, adoption? Uh, and 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 when and when we say adoption, it's the whole gamut of things. It's both physical, but it's also mental. It could be social. It is financial. You know, well-being. What are you seeing? Uh, you know, particularly in a place like Accenture, which has got this, you know, quote unquote, a homogeneous set of people working the common purpose and and there is a culture now that seems to embrace that so <clears throat> i'll uh, i think everything arvin says perhaps resonates in every area of work uh, you know no matter which workplace and i truly believe it because you know there is a varying rate of adoption I, I think let me start with this, right? Wellness can take any dimension. It can be physical, mental, spiritual. Um, it can be financial, social. 
uh, and you know the reality is each one of us i think first and foremost each one of us will prioritize it if we did a simple wheel of life exercise and you know just measured the health the likelihood is we will find ourselves in assigning varying degrees of importance to each one of those we'll also land up assigning various varying degrees of ranking depending on how it's important or how we are faring and our own evolution um you know where i'm going with this is john it's <clears throat> extreme it's not a simplistic response uh and it's extremely it's actually fairly complex and i you know i personally keep thinking about this quite a bit to say how do you get everybody to march on together and i think eventually i've settled for saying so long as you get everybody marching it is good you can you know march on wellness in any aspect that is important to you in any direction that you set it to be and what one can truly strive to do in the ecosystem is to make <clears throat> resources available uh to people to use to actually explore and firstly understand uh you know where they are and what they want to do and then actually be able to go and do it so you know that's in my mind you know any workplace or actually any space that i have seen the culture of wellness starts to settle in when there is a great degree of understanding of all of this it is to say that marching is okay. marching is good marching in any direction that you set is good um you know progress is better than perfection and we don't have to you know our destination need not be the same and i think the ecosystem that's truly striving to give a whole bundle of resources to ensure that it can cater to a wide array of people and you'll still fall short of them uh, you know if if depending on you know even if you have a handful of people you could still fall short of them so um you know and i think to respond to uh your question more specifically i think it's it's been a it's been a journey of creating these resources uh you know both uh, material resources uh intangible intangible resources and resources in terms of people and since we are talking about wellness and coaching i'll touch on that and i think a big part of the journey is also creating these resources of people people who can be ambassadors of wellness people who can actually point you in the direction of resources of wellness people who can actually be the visible role model for you uh, to pursue wellness people who make wellness conversations okay and you know and the reality is no matter how big or small no one individual can truly be the torch bearer right so i think the other journey and arvin i you know we 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 you know i've also spoken about awareness uh you know education and then advocacy and advocacy is a really really big deal and that's where it ties into how can you turn really the entire ecosystem into a, you know a coaching ecosystem where everybody is just uh fostering and it can then therefore apply to anything beyond wellness too in driving elements of culture <clears throat> i'm uh, going to pause there i think uh, yeah 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 when could you yes, can just quickly it? chime in uh, uh, john right. uh, and venkat right. i completely agree with this you know and i think that uh, in a lot of companies in this day and age um i just want to make one note about uh, leadership having to walk the talk about that right because that's going to be critical because a lot of what we consume about our own leaders is now very easy it's documented it's available anybody can see it the reverse is also true yeah you know your uh, uh, you you have uh, uh, the lockdown has left you with 10 kilograms more uh, to love and that's uh, visible too you know so there's really no place to hide there is no place to hide if you are mouthing platitudes about look we want to get a get into a better space we want people to be fitter stronger faster miss coding the olympics is um is great but unless everybody and by leaders i don't necessarily mean the people at the top of the organization right you you can't be a manager managing 10 people 20 people four people two people one you can't be that and say this is important to me and not show it in terms of effort thought emotion you can you can't do that so i think that's the it has to percolate and as we know percolation takes time sorry for that quick interjection back to no, you 
Oh, mind is my mind is racing with rebuttals, but I'm going to hold down, John. Go ahead. So, Venkat, you spoke about these wellness conversations. What connections do you see between these wellness conversations and you know creating this whole culture of wellness in organizations, particularly at Accenture, as an example? So, wellness. Uh, see, con wellness convers any actually any conversation on any topic really. Uh, you know, is serves a few purposes. It's I think step one is it makes it okay to talk about a topic. Uh, you know, that's really fundamental. It is. It just gives permission to everybody that it is acceptable, right? It creates. I I truly believe. You know, having a conversation on any topic, depending on the you know the right tone, the right words, verbal, non-verbal communication, all going well. It creates psychological safety for that topic, and you know a topic like wellness in particular can be viewed as nice to do rather than a need to do. Though one may know, you know, intellectually at the gray cell level that you know there is a need to do, uh, but you know, it, you know, it may almost come across as a add on, a plus one, an extracurricular something that's taking you away without really acknowledging. So I think the power of that conversation is. One, it makes it okay. Uh, in a in a con in a space like mental wellness, it allows you to actually destigmatize if you can do it right. Uh, third, it serves the purpose of you know education, debate, evolution of the topic in the organization itself. I think the ultimate level of a conversation is where everybody is promoting that sense of wellness in another. Now imagine. If everybody in this pandemic just made it a habit of in weaving into every conversation, have you taken time off? And we know there is nowhere else to go, you know, at least in the middle of the wave too, right? I, and now people do go out, but it just foster, you know, having that conversation fundamentally creates psychological safety that you will not, you will not have a fear of missing out if you actually took time off. Second, it is okay. You're saying it's okay to take time off. Third, you are actually encouraging someone and reminding them constantly. And you know, fourth, you are promoting you know well-being in a manner of speaking. So you're giving somebody a resource to be well. So I think you know, in, with that illustration, I think that's what conversations on any topic really serve the purpose. Thanks, Vinkar. <clears throat> you know, given the fact that you touched upon mental wellness and mental health here, right, and the fact that uh, this pandemic has brought that to light in more ways than one. Uh, how have these conversations enabled the de-stigmatizing of this whole space of mental health, even which, even today, which people look at uh, with a lot of suspicion or a lot of apprehension, for example. So what, what kind of steps, and this is something that either Arvind or you, Venkat, could perhaps answer, or both. Sure, I, I'll, uh, Arvind, we all go ahead, go ahead. I'll I'll chime in after you. No, no, carry on. I think Accenture is doing a lot of great work in this space. Please. So you know, I, um, I I'll uh, more than Accenture. I I will uh, you know I, I'm going to speak about it from my observation across many many places. The you know what the pandemic did, especially for mental health, is took the conversation, made the conversation effortless because I think now there is an acknowledgement that like physical health, we all have mental health. And overnight, the conversation shifted from, uh, you know, talking about mental health was not just stigmatized, but it was also people didn't know how to and people didn't even acknowledge that there was mental health. And I, all those three things really went away after being locked in for two months. Right. So now the starting point is what do you do for the wellness of a person? Uh, the second, you know, the second big thing here is, you know, you actually are able to start conversations far more easily today, um, you know, than you could. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, you have, you actually have social networks that are driving it. Um, now, the other aspect around, you know, mental wellness is, it also became extremely prominent for those of us who've been a little observant um, or, you know, have have had uh, very, very uh, 
stressful ecosystems you know you know i think what the pandemic has also done is it has brought you know it has locked in people with the perpetrators of their abusers themselves in some cases right uh, and therefore you you were at a stage and there were you know there are people in demographics who are very very who are single who are locked in who i have spoken to personally uh, have almost been suicidal because of you know isolation loneliness and i've even had a very strange conversation with someone who said i i think i will forget what it means to have human touch by the time we end wave 2 right they've been they've been that isolated i think um, it has just brought about a deep sense of awareness that mental health is real it's 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 existent in each one of us and uh, i just hope truly that we move forward from here then when everything opens up uh, you know succumb to the fact that human memory is very uh, selective and limited at times arvind over to you yeah i think i'm just going to take a look at the other side of it right because uh, it's always been perfectly okay to call my boss and say look i'm i'm or my colleague and say i'm i'm not feeling good today and i can't come to work i've got a headache that's easy right importantly the boss knows or my colleague knows how to respond to something like that if i take the analogy to that to the mental health space and i say hey you know i'm not feeling at my best today right i know what i'm talking about i can't communicate it all that well in many organizations we have to understand and realize that people have to be trained to respond to something like that because they have not encountered this earlier this is alien to them this is two steps alien right they might have the same problem but still not know how to handle it right and that's something that it will have to be done by coaching by training in larger numbers as well as in terms of modeling it, it and it has to be done so i think from a destigmatization point of view people should do it and we must be aware of the fact that there are companies that are of a certain size or of a certain capability or strength or resilience built in who can handle this better if you're in a smaller company and someone at a key job where you're barely able to afford that person being away for a week's vacation a year says you know i'm not feeling great and uh, i don't think i can come to work for the next 4 days you know that for that person it's a very big problem right and they might have told you that they are going through a bad patch of some reasons but from the company perspective you also know it's a really large problem for the organization so the texture of that response will be graded across organizations some companies can systematize it can can say this is the response that you will have and this is what you will do in many cases economic reality might not allow that standardization of it or it might not allow the scale to even standardize something like that but what i do think it is done is i mean the last 15 18 months is you understand that this is part of the nomenclature that it's part of the narrative whether it is whether it is cricket and somebody saying they want to take care of themselves mentally or whether it's the olympics and uh, great athletes doing it remember that opportunity for them comes up once in 4 years or in this case fine it's not like oh i'm going to be back at office week after no you finish this your next one is going to be paris in 2024 right and they have the courage to say i don't think i can do this today right good or bad we all have viewpoints about it whether they should you know uh, you know suck it up and do it whether they can do it is it possible or not There, as many people will have that much plus one viewpoints right but the point is that by putting all of this into the mix and in terms of all the media that we consume you do realize that at least these conversations have begun right are they resolving themselves well well we don't know yet right we'll figure out as it goes ahead but at least the conversations certainly have a start point so we've had you know uh, in 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 people whom we know examples of people saying they need to take time off and of course we are all talking about you know uh, how people might reevaluate their lives their careers all of that put together because it's they understand that these are all umbilically connected so i think if you look at it from the aspect of the person as well as the organization it's interesting to see that these views are presented on both sides of it 
and there are various examples. It doesn't have to be only about one person's mental health. For example, we were doing a session for a company where they had lost someone senior, and we had to make sure that there was a session on you know handling the grief that comes with it. Now, this is not something that either the company has done earlier, or that we have done earlier, or the employees have gone through. We, this is new to all of us, right? But it was needed, and it was good that it got done. Can it be done better? Sure. But have we begun? I think that's the thing. We have lived off, and I think that's a good start to this. So while it is, it it has been a trying eighteen months. It is not all gloom, gloom and doom. It, some good things have happened as a result of it, right? And we have to be cognizant of those possibilities that have emerged. Back to you, John. Thanks, Arvind. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to change tack a little bit here and go to another part of. Um, you know the discussion where it concerns um, uh, women in, in at women at work, and particularly in the pandemic, what it has done to such women, especially who have been also managing families, that you know the pressure has been doubled. Uh, you know there is children, there is um, homeschooling, um, there is the the partner of the spouse, and then there is no maids available, for example, and then all of you know all of that. Pressure kind of uh, you know was brought to bear on many such women all over this country uh, and perhaps the world. You know, it's not just limited to India. Um, you know, anything that you all saw that you all were able to uh, make shifts in some of these areas that might have benefited uh, you know the the women folk at large because they carry a huge burden on themselves. And it's not to say that men have not chipped in. So for the men. <laughs> Who are, who are feeling probably that hey you know I, I I pull my weight it's it's the fact that sometimes women carry the bigger weight in that sense so just curious about where you know how this was or perhaps what was the thinking in this direction any of you whether it's at Accenture or Arvind in any of the companies that you are concerned let me, uh, Becker, do you want to go ahead sure 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 I I think. Uh... Firstly, I'll start by saying I think I just work with uh, women. Uh, I work with a lot of women. My half my leadership team is women, and uh, uh, you know, uh, my, you know, single moms, uh, moms, single folks. So I think the entire uh, a large spectrum. I wouldn't say the entire spectrum, and I think uh, I've just been awe inspired every single day for the last 18 months without exception uh, even more than i have been in the past because there are days i imagine how they how they show up at work every single day and have the energy because uh, you know sweeping mopping doing the dishes and just getting myself to be in front of the laptop for 12 hours i was dead and then there is homework and then there is you know, cooking, and then there is, I, I still know many people, many women and families that have decided not to take up, you know, and even though the load is shifted, and as much as we believe everybody is helping, uh, you know, there is a tilt of balance uh, with a lot of load on the women. So I think I just want to start with that acknowledgement. Second, one is learning in this space. Third, I think my personal observation is that uh, you know the pandemic has also helped as much as it has caused a strain it has also helped women stay in the workforce and i think the biggest mantra to engage has been acknowledge number one that there are differences and there are realities uh, number two is uh, engage not just the person but their families because if you if you learn to go to engage you know people at home also when you're doing a webinar for example you know if you can run virtual summer camps for kids right uh, so how do you understand go beyond so one is to acknowledge i think step two is to understand that ecosystem and how can you ease that ecosystem virtually uh, by being creative is is really uh, number two but I think, and the third side is also, um, you know, what so one is easing their ecosystem, and from I think the third bit is 
from your side what can the ecosystem really ease up on right is it on uh, truly meaning that the flex you know are you helping the person drop boundaries are you giving you know flexibility in in the working hours uh, you know are you really truly in spirit encouraging if somebody needs to go on part time so on and so forth so i think it's it's a combination of all of those arvin we can see companies do you know some of the efforts in this direction but i must say i'm a bit of a pessimist in this matter right I, and i'm just saying this because we would view things across multiple companies and i think every company has its own particular reality but uh, the question that i always ask myself is is this likely to be a stable long standing change that effectively changes the construction of people's days i completely concur with what venkat said about uh, it's allowed people who earlier could not go to office and do a job to actually say i can do a job you know for four hours a day or something those options were not available earlier and they can do it from not a big five city or big 10 city or you know a big 20 city they can do that but about whether it actually changes in the long term is something that i think the jury is still out on right so i'm not i'm not convinced it is there but i wish to take this thought and segue into something else you know we, we talk about people getting healthier and other organizations getting healthier and something we discussed earlier was really if somebody is to get healthy you have to have the whole family unit doing it right and not just the family unit you have to have the family unit doing it you have to have the community amenable to the thought and the company amenable to the thought if this trinity is not in place at least this trinity there are other other things that can happen and other groups that can have a role to play but if this trinity is not in play and if you're trying to get fitter physically emotionally anyway um well all the best because it's going to be really difficult right it's going to be really difficult if you think you're going to eat healthy and your family doesn't think so or indeed the other way around it won't work it won't work for some of you and the thing in 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 well being in being in in a good space in your mind and body about it and your wallet and your community is that it's either everybody wins or really nobody does and i don't think people see the asymmetry of the game fundamentally right i don't mean make to me to make it sound like a game theory thing it's not that's not the intention but it really is that either everybody can pull together and make this happen or really it all goes south and that's going to be something that families are going to try at and you know the success rates will be very low at the beginning because we are not poised for that transition from where we were to where it is and the reason i tie these two things together is because this has an impact in uh, communities let's take an example so it's not theoretical right uh, we have organized uh, runs for thousands of people literally literally thousands of people right and there are so many runners coming in right a large number of them most of them are men a few of them are women now there's a reason for this discrepancy right whether i like it or not and i'm a, a, a guy who runs once in a while but if you're going for a long run for a couple of hours and somebody is to take care of the kid guess what it's not you because you're outside on the road somewhere right so these things are related so how do you make sure that day to day mundane circumstances are tied together so that everybody can get better is going to be a huge and evolving challenge so if you go back to the broad arc of this conversation about getting everybody to rise up together well everybody is going to push and have to push in the same direction and you'll have to change all these parameters including what women do and what they don't to get there right so just thought it's important to see the connections in the context that interlink these multiple facets of our debate i just thought i'll bring that in john back to you yeah so in many ways what i'm hearing uh, arvin is this you know you spoke about the trinity that it almost seems that it is just not organizations but it's also our communities that have to be part of that equation so that collectively we can make that difference uh, in terms of health yeah i think it, it it is going to be a bunch of things that have to change right you have to think about it in very practical terms let's take examples bombay with the weather being where it is and you know john you hail from there i hail from there right but the thing is with the weather being what it is 
unless you have a circumstance of getting fitter and remember uh, your house in bombay might be 464 square feet so it's not like you're going to jog inside the house right bangalore might be a little more generous in terms of space so unless these various things fall into place so unless there is an area downstairs where i can go and run around you know a 200 meter lap at least or something like that how do you make that happen unless the organization say it's okay i'm not going to get you into a call at seven o'clock because you know that's when you probably spend time meditating how how is it going to work unless your 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 spouse and kid gender respective actually respect the fact that you need 30 minutes time to get your head in order it's not going to work so unless the organization comes if the community is not going to let you do this for whatever reasons, right? If they say, please don't play badminton at six o'clock in the morning, it wakes us all up. Not going to work. You see, the, 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 the constant refrain here is, it's very easy to say it's not going to work. Making it work is going to get a, take a lot of pushing by everybody. So the local community, the company, the family, everybody is going to have to put their shoulder to the wheel. And you know, like we were saying earlier, it, you have to get the horse to swim, not the horse to drink water. Yeah. <laughs> to get the horse to swim in this circumstance, yes. and that's that's really what I think it's going to be. It's going to be a nice, interesting, very possible but difficult challenge. So, so thank you for you know, given the fact that we have uh, what you know, a little less than fifteen minutes, uh, and and the fact that we have a whole bunch of coaches on the call, and we have a coaching competency called uh, you know, coaching competency number two, which talks about embodying a coaching mindset, and it's also about being a coach, both in the physical, mental, and emotional uh, space. What are some of the, uh, you know, practical things that you guys can suggest uh, for our coaches here that might be a good takeaway for them uh, uh, to become better coaches? Venkat, you're better equipped to handle this than I am. <laughs> no, actually, you know what? Uh, the foundation of coaching is in sports, Arvind. And I, I am almost certain you can give us every trick in the book with That's what you true. do every single day. No, I, you know, we, when we were when we were chatting earlier, right? Um, uh, in, in sports person, there are there are there are some rules about things, right? Um, there are rules like you can't out train a bad diet. Venkat, you were saying something similar when we chatted the last time. More, right? You can't out train a bad diet. Yeah, yeah you can't out train it. You just no matter what you do, you can't do it. It's just not possible, right? Or something simple, which is get into bed on time, right? Sleep is the first thing that we will knock off our calendar because it is so dispensable. It's okay. I can, instead of seven hours, I can do six today. And I'm guilty of it more times than I, I hate to admit how many times I'm guilty of it, right? I've, uh, I've built, a, 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 let's say, a medical history and a, and a career professional history doing that, right? But the thing is that if you don't get your, your nutrition, your your rest and your exercise, physical, mental, all together in play. I don't think you can grant your complete self like Venkat said to work. You just can't do that. It's not possible. If the, the clinical thing, when we did a session in, in the in the cognitive summit about it, the, the clinical thing is if you're short on sleep, you it's the equivalent of being mildly drunk. That's reality. That's science, right? You might not like it, but that's reality, right? And I think that when we see people do that, you realize that if you're trying to be a good professional, no matter which side of the table you're on or what you're trying to do, you have to get this right. And it's a daily battle. This battle will not go. You cannot win this today. You have to win it today. Go back and battle up tomorrow to fight that same battle tomorrow. And you have to fight it with a bunch of people, not all of whom might be aligned. So I think that if you can just get these things right and get the basics in place, it's actually very simple, but it's simple but hard and they're not the same thing, right? So as, as long as you can do that, you might be able to do a better job as uh, as a coach or as really indeed anything that you're trying to do. I don't know. I, I know that battle because I keep fighting with Netflix and Amazon all the time. <laughs> yeah, now this battle has migrated. The zone has migrated. The battlefield <laughs> earlier used to be my laptop. I shut my laptop, I'm done. But hey, the battlefield is now my phone. So I have to consciously tell myself, okay, here's a rule, right, for everybody. Two things, you, you know, we always said we should have something actionable. One, don't take your phone to bed. Two, um, put an alarm to go to sleep, not to wake up. Put an alarm to go to sleep. You'll wake up by itself. Your body is 
you know it's a few million years old to figure that out just just simple things to do simple things if you can do those two things you will have a better week starting 10 days from now just take my advice on it and i know it's not easy because i'm trying and fighting myself but uh, uh, you know you have to make a start somewhere the first stand has to begin some place thanks arvin um i know that we have uh, just um, you know about 10 minutes to go so i want to you know just check with raj raj um, you know um, if 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 there are any questions that people have posed one or two questions you know that we may want to take you know we have to do that look at that and then i want to be mindful of that people will need to start the next session and that will be sure thanks john and thank you of questions coming thick and fast in 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 the chat box so i'm going to take a few randomly um i think pile had one early on is there any data to show why individuals and employees are unwilling to spend the time on wellness because they think they're invincible when you are 25 you never think about mortality average age in indian organizations is just around 30 at this point time the demographic dividend is also the uh, great uh, demographic uh, uh, blindness spot because you don't see it you just don't see it. you think you're invincible that's the reason people don't do it at least that's what that's the biggest reason i see Uh, so that <laughs> that's an honest answer. Thank it for you, perhaps. Uh, uh, there's a trend that you know a lot of corporate leadership health initiatives start from top down. Um, what what are some ways we can make it more inclusive? Question from Vinita, I think. Several questions from Vinita, but I picked this one. Sure, sure, sure. What um, what we can do to <clears throat> Okay, let, I'm just going to paraphrase. So I got this right, Raj. You know, she. You know, the question is, everything. If it is happening top down, how are you making it inclusive? Is that is that the question? I I think I that was the, the gist of the question from the chat box. But yes, I, I'm I'm going to make an attempt. I think you know, as I said, nobody, no single person can do it, right? You have to create. You have to actually pretty much get everyone going. now which is when i think arvind you were making the point on you know leaders have to embody and i said i am i'm churning with the rebuttal so i think that i'm i'm <laughs> you know i think philosophically i think you know it is okay to not be okay right it is okay to it's it's absolutely i think that's the number one mantra of mental wellness it's okay to not be okay it's okay that you have 10 extra pounds at the end of uh this and it's okay that you're fighting with depression and it's okay you know you have no idea what your spiritual beliefs are but i think you know just having that being inclusive is just saying that it's okay to not be okay and we have to really empanel everybody to do this and uh, we will keep talking about it till the cows come home and it becomes a way of life eventually but i think you know that journey also is never ending because you know people keep growing people keep changing roles new people keep coming in so you know i don't think anybody you know to be inclusive you have to keep the communication on uh, without worrying about uh, whether each person is truly embodying it or not so long as trust and safety in keeping the topic alive is maintained and i very personally very strongly believing believe in creating psychological safety for anything that we talk about and raj if i can take 30 seconds more john to your earlier question yes. on uh, marrying wellness and coaching and since this is an icf conclave i have to use some core competencies right yes, yes. four of them jump out to me and i pull them up one is i think you know embody a coaching mindset you know you can't force anybody into wellness all you can do is encourage them uh two is uh, you know cultivate trust and safety which i have spoken about you know the third is evoke awareness right yeah. it's it's a it's a great thing you can do and the last one is facilitate the person's growth no matter how they decide they want it to be and in any direction they want it to be so long as there is growth i think i i did want to respond to that yeah back back yeah and venkat apologies i'm glad there's a clarification from minita i think what she meant to say was uh, you know leaders who are personally invested in fitness tend to drive the change i think that was the point i think she was i think so i i may have misrepresented apologies vinita but thank you for that clarification sure so i i i am i am fit i am hoping i'm inspiring a few people everybody talks to me about it and continues to many people continue to tell me how they haven't moved out of their uh, homes or haven't done 
three days of strength training. But uh, but here is what I'll leave it with, Vinita. I think uh, each one of us is a can also be an invisible role model, right? You don't know who's watching you, right? And therefore, you know, to continue to believe that each one of us is a leader in our own right and somebody's watching it and is getting inspired is good enough. You don't have to necessarily see it in your immediate vicinity. Thanks, Venkat. Arvind, maybe one back to you, this one from Baskar and across, you know, the organizations you're working with, saying, um, you know, how if in any way our organizations uh, looking at extending wellness beyond just the employee, you know, you all talked about uh, the ecosystem. It's not just, are you seeing quite a few, uh, you know, organizations work in that space? Oh, I'm very happy to report in the positive on this. You know, uh, part, I think companies are doing what they can. Uh, for example, uh, what we do for organizations, we always uh, extend it and companies are very happy to extend it to families so that if somebody in the family wants to have a nutritionist consultation or something, it's available to them. And I think that's a good start point for most people. So companies are trying and taking this. They're also aware of the the broad framework, you know, the Trinity framework that I was talking about. So they do understand that it's important to carry everybody along on this mission. And it's not a, it takes the village to do this. So uh, I think companies are uh, very aware of this and are doing the best they can in the circumstances that they have um, to uh, carry families with them. And I think this is going to be the new contours of the battleground that you're going to have to take this expected change across a much larger bunch of people. Back to you. Reassuring to hear, um, Arvind. Thank you for that. Um, Venkat, a question from Sriram to you, and this is a, maybe posed to you, but probably has a wider. So while a lot of corporates in the pandemic situation are talking about, you know, the emphasis on uh, health, wellness overall, uh, but one of the first things when, you know, there is a top line impact, the budget cuts first hit l and and training. What, what's your perspective on that? Oh, I did see that uh, question earlier. My perspective is very simple. It uh, really, uh, you know, there. I, I, okay, I don't want to be judgmental. I think the fact is you can either see it as a glass half, half full or glass half empty, really. And uh, it's a paradigm, right? I've personally experienced a paradigm when things get tough, you invest in training because it's a great time to invest in training, keep giving people purpose. Um, and, um, you know, and it, it gets, it's a good time. It's good downtime also for you to get ready for the future. The other way is to say, am I fighting for survival? And I think, you know, it also is a function of the reality of the organization, the vision. It's a little more complex than I, I'm sorry, it's, it's a very, very complex topic, right? It depends on the paradigm, the variables an organization is dealing with. Um, and um, it could also be very deeply cultural. But I, I leave it at that. And I, I did share with you what I'm experienced to, and I personally see it as an opportunity. Thank you, Venkat. Um, I know we had two minutes, so there are a few more questions. But again, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to offer on your behalf that if there are some questions we could uh, you know, post them back to you, Arvind, Venkat, and John, so that, you know, we can get some responses back to folks who have questions that are unanswered. But John, I'll hand back to you if you want to kind of, you know, uh, wrap up and then I'll, I'll do the closing. Yeah, no, I just want to, you know, say a big thank you to both Venkat and Arvind for being so, so generous uh, with their uh, thoughts and, 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 you know, leaving us some, some things to take home with us uh, tonight, you know, in terms of health. So thank you both. Well, thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you to definitely Alvin and Venkat, but John, for you as well. I think we couldn't have had, uh, you know, a more well-rounded session and set of perspectives. Uh, if you'll excuse the pun from folks who are actually walking the talk, right, every day, yourselves as well as in the organizations you work with. So thank you so much for your perspective. Clearly, from the session, we came away with many takeaways. And, and you know, I, I love the one-liners uh, Setting an alarm to sleep is, is going to be my mantra, but health yeah. is clearly multidimensional. And I say that not just from, you know, your, what you said, it's individual organizations and communities. You made that point brilliantly. And the connect back, John, that you made to coaching, right? The humanness, uh, you know, the potential aspect and as well as the purpose aspect that you brought. And, and you know, underlying all of that, the behavior change that ultimately has to drive 
you know, the horse swimming as you you can you have the horse has to start swimming was another brilliant takeaway. Thank you for that. And um, last but not least, uh, a lot of um, you know not just anecdotal evidence, but from the work that both of you all are doing in not just your own organization, Venkat, but I mean, from the organizations that you're seeing across, it's heartening to know, you know, some of the data. Uh, I, I'd love to leave on that note, you know, glass half full, and we've definitely made a great start, lots of work to be done. I'm really looking forward. I hope that some of you on the audience who uh, have some great takeaways from the session, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a minute to thank the sponsors of this conference for enabling this session. Uh, again, thank you, each one of you, for making the time and, and to the audience for making it such an interactive session.